Because your father raced, you're in round raising from the very start, from the sport. What's your earliest recollection of racing? Of racing? Well, I'm going to have to not back up a little bit, but I remember being three, four years old. My dad used to run Super Modifieds, and we had just built a new shop behind the house. And with that shop being there, I used to go in there and, and jump and sit in that car. Like, you know, like every yeah. little boy does, got to sit in yeah. some type of car. Well, we didn't have go-karts or any of that stuff sitting around. So I remember sitting in my dad's car, which at that time, that car, he won a Oswego Classic back in 1966. So I'd have been three years old at that point in time. I do remember that. Wow. That's cool. It is cool. Now, the Michigan Motorsports Hall of Fame bio on your dad describes him as a very complex person <laughs> <laughs> who is many things to many people. What does that mean to Johnny Benson Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's tough. I, I, you know, because I, I don't sometimes don't understand the complex part of it. You know, I'd uh, he had me working in the shop like at seven years old, six years old. I remember grinding old frames and grinding stuff, and then uh, pretty soon he had me running laves. And then um, I remember, I think I was seven. I watched him weld aluminum race seats at the time, and I, I used to love watching him do that. And then pretty soon he was like, oh, show me how to practice. By the, by the next day, he had me welding aluminum seats and things of that nature. So I don't know if he's, he wasn't complex in my world, but uh, um, he, he always just taught me different things. And, and then he would only teach me a small bit, and then you had to figure it out on your own. So you figured out all your mistakes. Yeah. And then you figured out this, and then he had come back and say, how many mistakes you made? You know, well, I don't know, 30? <laughs> <And, laughs> or, or, you know what I yeah. mean? And then, he, and then he, he would tell you how to get around it. He didn't show you how to get around it. He showed you how to get just far enough <laughs> to make enough mistakes. Yeah. And then when he showed you around it, yeah. you just learned a lot more. Was there ever a chance that you were going to make a living doing something other than raising? <laughs> ever a chance? I never thought I'd make a living doing racing. So oh, really? there, you know, when I was young, I, I'd, uh, and, and this is always stories people tell, but when I got in trouble, my dad made me go to the races. When my sister got in trouble, they made her, they went and let her go to the races. So that's how I, when I grew up, I didn't, I didn't have any ambition to do that, you know? And so people don't realize that I didn't start racing until I was 18, 19 years old. And it was one of those deals. My dad, dad let me drive his car when I was like 13. And then I was like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. I love building race cars. I love trying to figure out the technical side of it and make cars go fast. So that's what I did. Well, when my dad retired, which would have been 81, all of a sudden I'm like, well, who's going to race for the company? Because we built parts, components, and race cars. And so that's at that point in time when I said, all right, I'm going to race. Right. But, I, but I was doing it for fun. I, I started off on dirt, which my dad didn't care for. But so I did that about three years, and then I um, converted over to the to asphalt. But um, it was never a, I never considered a point of doing it for a living. And even when I was doing it for a living, I still didn't look at it that way. I was doing it because I loved racing. Right. Did you ever race against your dad or no? I had not. That was one thing I probably would have loved to have done. He he got in a bad wreck there right at the end of his uh, his career. So when I raced, he didn't race. He drove my car one day. Uh, when I first started running asphalt, but never got that opportunity to race against each other. And we do talk about that every once in a while. And of course, he says, well, I'd have kicked your butt anyway. So I, just, <laughs> I go, I, I'm pretty sure you would have, but it would have been, it, it, I probably, I miss that memory that I don't have. It's, uh, that would have been really cool. Whether it just would have been one race, it would have been so cool to race with him because he's, he's in, in, you know, the racing and him teach me and stuff like that. I mean, he is, people ask, who's your favorite driver? Who's your idol? would definitely be my dad so it would have been cool to to do a race with him 1992 you were involved in a crash while racing asa up at cayuga speedway in canada and you just so happened to have an in-car camera that day and i mean it showed you stretched all the way across the race car yeah. how how badly were you injured or were you just sore or was I, it I really wasn't hurt at all, you know. I mean, I mean, yeah, you kind of do that little stretch, oh, yeah, kind of, kind of. But nobody's ever seen a film like that. Yeah. And when that happened, I had people. 
I think they were out of Texas. I think they were doing something with the, the safety stuff and with Hans and all that. Yeah. They called and says, can we use that video? And I go, absolutely. Yeah. You know, And I think, I, and I don't know about that today, but for many years, NASCAR still uses that to show people that what can happen. And But right after that had happened, or not right after that happened, when I first came down here to run in the NASCAR scene thing, I remember Neil Bonnet coming up to me and coming up, he goes, man, that film that you're talking about from Cayuga. He goes, I used to tell my guys I got in a wreck and he says, I hit my head on that halo bar up there. And they all thought I was nuts. He says, for years. And he's and, uh, he was just like, I'm telling you, I hit my head. And he says, the minute I saw that film, he goes, I brought it to the shop and I showed <laughs> the guys, he says, I'm telling you, I hit my head. And so that that's uh, uh, amazing, amazing footage. And I don't know if there's anything else similar to that, that would really show people how far we were behind on safety. Now, you, you said that the Hans people got in touch with you about it. Did you know, wasn't it used in, in conjunction with the Dale Earnhardt report? Yeah, absolutely. But okay. it was used yeah. before that, too, okay. though. But yeah. it was definitely used in that. And, uh, you know, the Hans has been out forever. And I remember Kyle Petty using it. And it was such a, a massive piece, that they think, at that point in time, and people were uncomfortable getting in and out of the car. So whoever made that next step with being able to get it to the size that people could use it for and utilize it. I remember the first day I used it. Um, we were at Talladega and got hit and I got turned uh, going into three and I'm going to head on into the wall with it. And I was, that's the first time in a race car I go, this might hurt because it, you, you know, the, we're running at the bottom. It's going to take you a couple of seconds to get there. Normally you get a <laughs> fraction of a second before you hit. Yeah. This, three seconds is a very long time. And I remember, I go, this is really going to hurt. And I remember hitting the wall. I remember coming off the wall going, oh, my God, that wasn't so bad. Well, the next seven guys that hit me probably wasn't so good. But I just remember that first impact, and I've never gotten a car without that again, ever. ever. When did you – when when was that? What? Well, that would uh, – kind of when they first – it would have been in – it had to have been in 2000s, I think, when they – Okay. Um, I think when they started running. I remember I was with 10 cars, so it'd be, it might have been right at that. Okay. You know what I mean? They, yeah. they had the Hutchins device yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the first time that I was able to get a Hans. And Bob Lebani was the one that was adamant coming down there. She need to get one. I says, I can't find one that fits. And uh, then he gave me the direct number to somebody, and I got one for that weekend. And that was that was the day that I needed it. I was reminded of that video. We talked to Kenny Wallace back before Christmas, and he was talking about an accident. And he said, yeah, I hit my head on a C post. No, nah, you didn't hit your head on a C post. <laughs> Johnny Benson might have, <laughs> but you didn't. <laughs> it's a long ways away. Yeah, yeah. I said, no, nah, you wouldn't be here if you hit your head on a C post. Um, you won the ASA championship in 93. I did, yeah. Um, how did you wind up in Ernie Irvin's bush car at Michigan that August? How did that come about? It came about with, actually, that was a year def that I was running for the championship. It wasn't after, so it was still before yeah, yeah. we won the championship. But it's one of these one of these Earnhardt stories. I'm at the shop at my, at my mom and dad's place, and my mom comes in there and says, hey, there's some guy on the phone. I said, okay. He says, Earnhardt. Well, I'm, I'm in a, a third shop over here, so I had to walk all the way to the other shop. I go, there's no way. I said, whatever, take a message. A couple hours later, calls again, and he says, and she comes back in there, and he says, he says it's Earnhardt, and I, I know Earnhardt, but I mean, it was, I knew of him, obviously. And I go, there's no way. I said, fine. So I walk over there, and he goes, Benson. I go, yeah, it's Earnhardt. Okay? You know, I, I, still, I think somebody's playing a joke on me, like everybody says, but. And he goes, why don't you run my bush car at Dover? I'll get my guys to get back with you. And I says, okay, and he hung up. So a week or two went by, and then they called and said that Goodwrench won't allow Earnhardt not to run the race. And that's when Dover used to be 500 miles. Yeah. And he didn't want to do it because he's, you know, he's running for a championship, and yeah. that track obviously get pretty yeah. tired after that. So it didn't happen. Well, at that point in time, between him, or people at Chevrolet, good friends of mine, they, that, are, that are high up in there, Jim Covey and a couple other people, they... They got this deal together with Ernie, so then Ernie called and says, "Hey, come down here and run my car." So that's that's how that happened, and that was an interesting week because I, at that point in time, uh, Ernie and Kim were having their first um, 
first child. So Ernie wasn't at the racetrack. My car shows up late. I get a couple laps of practice. I got to go into qualifying, and we qualified decent. And then, of course, so the Bush car showed up. This is a Bush car showed up late. So I, I they're almost <laughs> practicing, and so I got like eight laps of practice. And uh, I, I can't remember Coochie, too many hoots, I think. But we, he goes, all right, just go out there and don't lift. I'm like, really? I only got six laps. You know? <laughs> but I think it was a V6 at that point in time. Now, had so you we, ever we, driven anything that big before? Nope. What's the biggest that, you'd run at that point? My LL8 model car wow. and an ASA car. I don't think an ASA car is as okay. big as an LL yeah. car. But, yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, it was quite the experience. But then on the, the second lap, I got tagged coming off two and and i'm thinking i'm just going to spin out i'm just going to go through the grass i'm going to get going life will be good <laughs> and all of a sudden i'm going through the grass and it gets really quiet and i go quiet quiet that's not good i'm thinking this isn't good i haven't never gone this fast yeah. and then pretty soon the car's up in the air and we flip five and a half times going down through the infield that i mean it stayed, so that it was stayed, my first time. it stayed it hovered like a helicopter. Yeah, it was crazy. It's crazy. If you look, I, I laugh when I look at the video. I, if somebody says they want to see it, I pull it up. I don't even talk about the car. He says, look at the grass and the dirt around the car. Looks like a helicopter landing. And that was. Uh, and then my next race was Charlotte, and all the crew members are yelling at me because that's when they put in the cowl. <clears throat> um, things in front of the hood there because Ernie also had a similar incident at Talladega. He didn't go over, but he was up in the air. Yeah. And then they made it so that everybody's like, oh, who's this guy? And they're like, you're the guy that made me put all these things in the car. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's going to be great to get remembered by that. But Now, what was Ernie's reaction to this? <clears throat> well, first he got on the radio and he says, is he all right? Because obviously yeah. he saw it. Because he started at the back because he didn't, wasn't there for qualifying. Ernie. And, so Ernie was in the race? Yeah. He, I ran a backup car with Ernie. So right. okay. Ernie right. sees the wreck. Okay. He's asking, you know, his people if he's all right, this and that, whatever. And they says, well, we'll know here in a little bit. He did get out of the car. And then pretty soon the guy's running down me. Ernie wants you on the radio. And Ernie's like, I'm going to pull in. Um, you run my, my car the rest of the race. I told him, I said, yeah, I think I had enough for today. I had enough today. Ernie. I appreciate it. No, I'm good. I'm, and, good. I'm good. And then when Ernie ran some races for base motorsports, too, at that time, Ernie was the reason why I ended up in base base motorsports car. Was that a situation where you were like, okay, that's it. That was my one shot at the Bush Series. I'm going to be running ASA for the rest of my life. Or did you, from the very outset, <clears throat> accept it as just something that happened in racing? Well, you, you, it was a, it was an experience that obviously wish would have went different. But even when I went into ASA. I run the outlaw cars at my home track, won the championship. I had no desire to even move any further than that. I love those cars. I love racing them. And then Butch Miller got an opportunity to move down here. Well, we used to build the rear ends of spindles for their cars, and they were 20 miles, 18 miles from uh, our race shop. And the owner of the car, when he left, he called me and says, hey, you want to run ASA car? I said yes before I thought about it. And then I was like, why do I want to do that? I don't want to run 300 laps. This is crazy. I like my 50 lap races. They're awesome. <laughs> and, and then, so I took that opportunity and then I just, that's what I thought I was going to do. And then I, and then as we talked about the thing with, uh, uh, with Earnhardt and Ernie, I just said, yeah. And I just did it. And I thought that's what I was going to do. I never, my goal was not to, my goal is to get to here, 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 here. I didn't, that was one thing that's unusual about probably my story to others. Everybody had to, I'm gonna run cup, I'm gonna run. I just happened just to work the way through there, but I wasn't rushing, trying to get there. I wasn't trying to set anything yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. That didn't go through my mind. I just love racing, whereas I, I was enjoying that moment and doing the best I could. So ASA at that point was good enough for Johnny Benson? It was good enough for me. Yeah. Awesome, okay. I, oh, racing was good enough for me. <laughs> and and it's, yeah. and then so obviously we went through that, but um, but that that's pretty much, um, there was never, I concentrated what I was doing. I wasn't looking forward to the next thing. I was looking forward to there because my dad always taught me before I, I graduated from this car to this car, whoever it may be, make sure that you can dominate that series before you move. Don't go before that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We spoke about the wreck. Did you make a coffee table or something out of that car? This, 
the I, I did make a coffee table out of a car, but it was a car that uh, we, the car that everybody talks about. I do almost won a Daytona 500. Well, yeah. I'd wrecked that car in uh, uh, the July race a year after that, and at that point in time, uh, you know, Alan Bessert, myself, Kenny Schrader, Mike Waltrip did that that Inside Winston Cup racing show. Both Kenny and Mikey had built, it, it crushed a car, and they just threw it out in the yard. Okay, got a crushed car. Well, I went and crushed the car, but then I cleaned it up, and I got a piece of steel set under, and I glassed it and cased it into a coffee table. <laughs> I still have it, and and, um, and so I, 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 you know, I just like, well, if I'm going to crush this car, we're just going to, there it is, and it's not going to rust and deteriorate out in the weather, so. It, but it's about 700 pounds. You can't just move it in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually have a crushed race car in your... In, in a your... glass box. It's a, it's a, it, well, it used to be in my race shop. And yeah. uh, I built a new place and, and moved. And now it's kind of sitting outside under a lean-to. I should get out and clean it up. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's just heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you wound up running a few Bush Series races that year for Bill, Mom mm -hmm. Gardner. Um, how did he first come into the picture? You mentioned Ernie. How did that? How did so that Ernie, happen? I don't, I don't really know the story on them too. How that? Because okay. Ernie had his own stuff. Yeah. But I, you know, it's like it's like when he was racing. When you're racing Cup, you don't, you have time, but you don't have time, and and so for whatever reason, um, I think Bill Baumgartner asked Ernie to run his car at. I don't remember what track it was, uh, uh, Orange County yeah. or yeah. or somewhere over there and he ran it and that was either just before or after i ran ernie's car and ernie told billy he says you got to put this kid in your car and then one day he called up and next thing i know i'm i'm at rockingham <laughs> or no charlotte i'm sorry yeah uh charlotte and uh, uh running his car and i think I, I ran i know i ran charlotte i ran um I think it was South Boston, uh, Rockingham. I ran those three races for Bill Baumgartner yeah. that year. At what point did he offer you the ride full time? Beginning in '94, I think. It uh, what? Well, I ran full time in '94, so yeah. it was sometime in '93. I ran those races with him in '93, so somewhere at the end of the season after winning a championship in ASA and Daytona. That conversation that happened, and I and I, um, I says, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Which you know, obviously, I had to move down here, so it was one of those deals. I got on a plane, one way ticket to come down to Charlotte, to get fitted in a car to go to Daytona, mm -hmm. and um, and then I ran full time with them. And partway through the year, we were just sitting there. Bill was always famous for calling me at nine thirty at night, and we would spend till three in the morning chatting. <laughs> So he's down at he's down at his office down there, and then he goes, "How old are you?" Because we used to ask about racing. Well, how could you have raced that much stuff? Which and I started late. I started yeah. nineteen. Yeah. And I told him at that time I was I was either thirty or thirty one, and he looked at me and he says, "What?" And I go, "Yeah." And he goes, "I didn't know that. I'd never hired you." And I says, "Well, we're kind of committed now." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, so we, we had won some races and uh, finished six hundred points. In one rookie of the year, um, and then the following year won a championship, and it was just it was amazing. I still look at all. I've won four championships in different divisions, and that was the one that always was is uh, is interesting to me because I did that in two years. Every one else I did, it's taken me four years or something like that. But I thought that was the oddest thing to be. Hey, this is a NASCAR Bush Series versus my Outlaw cars versus ASA, yeah. and and things of that nature. That still surprised me. We did that in the two years. That was uh, something pretty proud of. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you mentioned the five-hour phone calls with Bill <laughs> Bill Baumgartner. Uh, I, I'm familiar with those phone calls. Um, tell me a really good Bill Baumgartner story that tells who he is as a person. And one that tells who he is as a team owner. Boy, that's Bill, tough. I Bill mean, is there's... Bill is one of my favorite people in the sport. Randy LaJoy, I'm sorry I said that, I, but I, I take <laughs> I take ownership I, I, of I, I, it. I, 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 but yeah, um, yeah he, he's yeah. 
it, you got to learn how to tough. You learn you gotta, how to read. Yeah, him. I mean, you got to <laughs> learn to read him. And because you know, when you like you say, when you go see him, and it's three, four hours of of chat, which I which I'm good with, but. When you start at nine thirty at night and it's working two in the morning, at when you get to the eleven twelve o'clock, my uh, um, my memory aspect of things because I get yeah. tired. I don't listen yeah. to everything he says. But you know, just he he loves just you know motorsports and he you know he loved his business he had. So I mean, there's he's talking about stuff I don't want. I don't even know about with that with the. With the business aspect things, I you know I build race cars and have fun with them. I go make them go fast, yeah. and so the business stuff he's talking about, I, I'm not I'm not even catching a clue what he's talking about. <laughs> wasn't trying to teach me anything. Yeah. He was just talking yeah. about these things and all these places he's been, and you know across the country and why he's doing certain things, and and then it, you know our conversations were mainly about the racing too. Um, he was passionate about the sport, even though he's fairly new to the sport. And, he, and obviously he's built a good team that, that, you know, he won a fair amount of championships when you think about the short span that he was there. You know, so he, he was able to get good people around that scenario. And like with, you know, uh, with Birdie or Steve Bird being my crew chief there, you know, he knew what he was doing. So Bill was just supplying him with what he needed to go make that happen. But he was very passionate about that in his business, but then you look at the other side, um, you know, when he talked about uh, this family with, you know, Bobby and the kids and all that stuff, he was very passionate about his family side of things. And I've been on a few vacations with him and he's very different on that side to which you would be yeah. on the business side, which is sometimes you can't tell the difference in a person when they do that. So he was very different on a, on a personal side with the family things and um, you know I was lucky enough to be able to see that with them. Dover in the fall of 94 you've got a mirror full of Harry Gant uh, as the race winds down and you're able to hold him off for the first win of your career what do you remember about that? You know, I remember the whole race I remember myself and Harry, Harry Gant which at that point in time he was like oh my god I can't believe I might have been on the same racetrack with him yeah. you know type scenario because and so we were, we were running very well, along with Harry. They had a caution come out about halfway through the race, and I, they picked up the wrong leaders. Well, we were at the front of the field, when, especially when people pitted. And they were sitting there, well, you guys are lapped down, both me and Harry. We're like, we're not a lap down. We had not, or no, we did pit, I think, and we were still on the lead lapping up front. I still don't understand how that happened. But yeah. anyway, so they said, you're a lap down. And here is a lap down. And uh, even here, we're, we're like, we can't believe it. This is impossible. So we started on the inside row and we come all the way around and then got to the front. And I didn't have a problem with him behind me that whole time. I had a problem when I got the lead. <laughs> and I keep looking up and I see that green seven. I think you're kidding me. And, you know, I should have looked at the car screen seven but I looked at it as Harry Gant, which, <laughs> which is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and I know, you know, obviously he's one, he's one of the best out there. And I was just lucky enough to not make a mistake and stay ahead of him. But I still just remember, just keep looking in the mirror, and I go, I, and I'm trying to get. You know, my dad's always been very strict with don't make mistakes. Yeah. And I didn't make a mistake is the reason why I ended up still staying in front of him. All right. So this is Harry Gant, '94. This is the fall of '94, so he's his career's winding down. Yes, that would have been Harry Gant's last win, but that's okay. You won your first win. He still had a last race win. Did he? He just didn't do it at that day. <laughs> 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 he still won his last race somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> but not today. <laughs> So he still has that. That's it. But maybe not his last bush race he would have won. But he still had that. That's awesome. So, I'd, uh, so I'm, I'm, that's how I'm going to look at it. Okay. I, I didn't, right. okay. You know what? I didn't know it was his last race. Not that I would have let him win that. I can tell you that. No. But, uh, but no, he still had his last one somewhere. So so did I. <laughs> were, you, were you satisfied with that first full year in the Bush Series? And at the same time, what were your expectations going into 95? 
I, you know, race, race car drivers are never satisfied. You can yeah. win a race, and I can tell you five things that would have hopefully made it better. Right. And and I think that that you're, that's what your racers do. Um, you're still happy you won, but um, you think, okay, well, what could we have done different? So as that year went, yes, my first year full time in a Bush Series, which I only ran four races beforehand. And to come out of that and win a race your first year and to finish six in a points, yes, you could say that was satisfying because it was. It, 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 there's no denying that part of it. But you're always like, what do we got to do? What do we got to do to be better? What do you got to do to move forward? So it's not 100% satisfaction, but it's a, it's a, it's a high number. Um, so going back the following year and winning some races and winning a championship, you can look at that and go, yes, I am satisfied to win a championship, but you still, racers are, they ain't, we ain't that smart, but you're gonna look <laughs> back and find out. You can remember, I won the races, okay, I won the championship, but I can probably find five races that we messed up so bad and, yeah. and, and remember those as well as, as winning it. So, but I think that's what also makes championship um, very special. Now, does that make you a perfectionist that you're, you're even though you win the championship, you're, she's over there grinning ear to ear. <laughs> Maybe I should interview you. Yeah, I was going to say, let's talk to her. You know, when people say about perfectionists of, of racing, I look that in mine when I raced outlaw cars and run ASA, when you're the main guy doing everything. You're yeah. building your car from the ground up. You're doing, you're doing everything. You're doing all the scaling. You're doing, you're doing everything and trying to crew chief it all at the same time. That's where perfection is something that's would be important to me. When you move down here, there's a lot of variables. Yeah. You're not you're no longer that person. You can you can try to perfect everything that you're doing, but my role became big to small. I was doing everything. Now I'm just driving a car yeah. and I'm just trying to help with direction what the car needs. So that perfection changes now because it's because there's so many other people involved, and you know I used to go to the shop and work all the time. Finally, I had one of my guys come over there and he goes, "Dude, I don't want you working on a car," and I, and I took big offense to that. Yeah. I was like, "How can I not work on a car? This right. makes no sense." Right. And he goes, "You gonna let me drive the car Saturday?" <laughs> I go. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, well, then don't do my job. Yeah. And that really changed my perspective on the passion for them working on cars. We were talking about the other day. We don't know of a single team that has crewmen that want their driver to work on the car. They don't want him working on it. Hey, it's not just there. It's yeah. factory everywhere. Get it, out of here. It is. It, it, it's, it's, uh, so I did go a lot. <laughs> And I watch and I learn because I think that you have to know and understand every piece of the car to run good. Yeah. And I would, you know, that's something my dad taught me. I didn't realize that at the time when I was doing all that, how important it was. I do now. And I, my dad has always, always said this. He's, and he goes, the driver's only 15% of the program. He goes, you just drive the car. He says, what you do at the shop and everything you do before there is 85% of your success, not you as a driver. That, that's what he told me. I, I didn't believe him. <laughs> I was like, oh, that can't be true. I thought we did pretty good. But as as you move up and go through things and you go through different uh, places, like if I was at this team versus this team, they got access to all the same stuff, but why did I run so good here and I can't run good there? Well, now you're looking for excuses, right? <laughs> so now you're like, okay, maybe that 15% might be true. And I think now that I've gone through everything and still go back and do some short track race stuff like that yeah i probably probably put a lot of weight on that because there's going back to what we were just talking about there's so much stuff out of your control when you don't do everything yourself right. obviously this sport today there's no way you can do everything yourself so it, it it i don't even think you can on the short track stuff it's uh it's very difficult but um so you always look at what really was your role? And, you, and I think as a driver's role, you got to help give the, the team guys and the crew chiefs a direction on really where the car needs to go. Because I, I get this all the time, building cars, customer call and say, well, I'm loose getting in, what do I do? I don't know, I can give you 15 things. You know, you got to help me try to figure out why it's loose getting in. Is it sway bars, springs, shocks, track bars, yeah. all these things. And um, 
I think your your great drivers obviously have a lot of great talent, but they also understand the car enough to give them a direction what end of the car and what corner to work on. And, and I, I think that's very important in today's driver. They have to be able to do that. And But I think with all the engineering on there, you know, they, they can find different things that we couldn't find back in the day. But um, I always think it's important that a guy can that can point to the car and yeah. say, you better be working on that corner. Wow. 95, Chad Little had this just absolutely monster year. Uh, he won at Daytona, Talladega. The very next week he won at South Boston. But you took the lead in the point standings after the fourth race of the season. And with the exception of just one week, about midway through the year, you were on top the rest of the way. What was the difference? Was it just solely consistency? Well, that does play a big part. Um, you know, with the rules back then and how the points were, things that consistency was good. You know, it was it goes back to not making mistakes. You know, you can you can go through a year and have a great year and run first, second, third, fourth, fifth, win some races. This and you're going to be in pretty good shape. We've seen that a lot of a lot of the press and all that make scenarios over when NASCAR switched to the new point system. In the beginning, they always says, "Well, X Y Z would have won this on the old system," and it's true. But so consistency was good. Chad and uh, and those guys are very competitive, very good. I think we we're good and competitive also. He won a lot more races. I think we won two. I won Hickory and won Atlanta, but but we were always kind of right there. And then, you know, they we didn't have any engine problems. We didn't have any failures. They had some failures that kind of put them behind. And I think when that gap grew, you know, then you're getting into desperate. They want to win the championship as well as we did. Some mistakes were made. You know, they, they would get involved in an incident. and But I had too. But I think when we had them, they weren't as disastrous as yeah. it was to us as it was him, which made the points push us out, um, push us out pretty far. Well, rock it in that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. Last lap. I want to hear your version. Because <laughs> it was awesome. I still I still show people that today. I says, you want to see a cool race? Now, that wasn't our race the last race of the year, but it was a race to determine yeah. if we could have won a championship. You know, I was leading enough. I could have probably won it at Charlotte. And uh, I got underneath a guy that I probably not not with him as Jimmy Spencer but he he was he was there and I kind of I I stepped over my edge probably and I should have been a little bit more patient but I had such a big point lead I'm like we're gonna go try to win this race and I and I went down underneath them and then at that point I was like oh I think I just messed up and I was just a little I was a little loose and then when I got down there I I lost it and hit um, it hit Jimmy, and then we both we both crashed. Obviously, he wasn't happy. I wasn't happy, but there it was like a, a good lesson learned that you're like, you know what, you're leading in points, you're doing good in the race. I we were near the front, and I felt that we could win a race, but I'm gonna have to be aggressive, and I picked the wrong time to do it. And uh, so I mean, I I crashed Jimmy and myself. Brings us to Rockingham. We were all running pretty good. I didn't run good in the beginning, but I was running good at the end. And um, so it was what, Mike Wallace, myself, and uh, David Green. We're all right there running. Well, then I think Tabo Dime come in and got tires, and he come into the picture there. And then uh, I still remember watching it and listening to um, uh, Buddy Baker. He's like, he's got one last chance. He's going to have to get underneath him. And then I just went Whoops. to the outside. <laughs> Where's he going? And he, he's like, "Oh, <laughs> you know, like I didn't, I didn't see that coming." Type thing, which I didn't either. But um, so I mean, I went out there, and Mike starts running me up the track, and we start bumping off for him, and he, he run me pretty high, and then I I kind of leaned on him like, "Hey, I'm side by side. Yeah, don't put me in a wall here." And we bumped, and then we bumped again, and then Todd comes out of the out of the picture, running down on the bottom, and he had a good run off there, and I think with me. Me and Mike banging tires slowed us down enough. He wins the race. <laughs> but it was three wide going across the line, and I think between the three of us is yeah. like a foot. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Now, you 
were credited with third place, but that was still good enough to clinch a championship. Mm -hmm. Was there any disappointment in not winning the race, or did the big picture of the championship erase that? I was disappointed we didn't win the race. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, the points, the points thing. I mean, it it would have took a, it would have took an act of a lot of things for us to lose it at that point in time because yeah. we basically yeah. almost had a race lead. Yeah. And so you you just take your chances and you go. And so I didn't I didn't. At, I, you care about champions, don't get me wrong, but I didn't care about it at that race because I wasn't at jeopardy of having any, that was a non-war. Yeah. Um, you know, so you run hard and it was, you know, there, I would rather finish third trying to pass the guy for the lead and the win than I would to just ride behind him and finish second. So that doesn't, that doesn't bother me at all. That's good. Okay. And yeah. I finished third, yes, but but it was, it, but it was close. Yeah. <laughs> it was a cool ending. It was a cool ending. How did, <clears throat> how did the deal come about to go into Winston Cup racing with Bahari? And what was Bill's reaction? Um, I think, it, you know, going back to Bill, Earnhardt tried to get me to go over and run his bush car after my first year there. He went to Bill and wanted to basically steal me and bring me over there. And... He didn't. Um, he didn't say anything to me. At first, I found out about it later. So it was just one of those deals. Now that we won the championship, um, I was I tight with some people with Chevrolet. This kind of came on. There's two things that kind of happened there. But and then so truck rider from Bahari called me up. Says, Hey, you want to have dinner? We talked once or twice, and he. He was like, I did a handshake deal. He says, yeah. I says, I'll, ru I'll run your car. Now, I ran with Bill Bumgarner with no contract. And did you really? I did. I, I, it, it's, it's funny, I did, not to get ahead of the story, both my championships that I won in NASCAR, I didn't have contract with, which is weird, especially later, but maybe not so much. So I, I gave him a handshake, told him I'd do it after some conversation and things of that nature. And I'd watch your team. I've, I've watched it, you know, because we're at Bush races. You're going to watch. I, I, I do pay attention. So um, I thought it was a pretty solid team there. So I said that. Following week, I remember it was at Talladega, so I don't know what race before. I did remember it was Talladega because I see Michael Waltrip heading my way. <laughs> and, of course, he's 6'4", you know, and, and uh, he comes up and he says, you talking to Chuck Ryder? I go, Yeah. And the look on his face was not priceless, but he looked at he, he wasn't expecting me to say, yeah. I go, yeah. And he goes, oh. And he asked a couple questions, and he says, well, he told me that you were going to do something different. And he says, no. And I, then I was like, well, then I don't want your ride. I don't, that ain't, I'm not here to steal your ride. He just told me you're doing something different, or he, he kind of said that maybe they're going to do a two-car team. And he says, okay. And he walked away. <laughs> and I was, uh, but the look on his face when I says, yeah, I was talking to him. I, he, I think he was expecting me to say no. Yeah. Wow. And um, so we've, we, you know, we come actually decent, decent to each other and friends after that because I just told him the truth. So, yeah. and then, so that's how that carried on. Well, before that was happening, Ernie Irvin called me again and he goes, hey, you ain't just putting a second car together. We want you to drive it. And I says, I can't. I just, told Chuck Ryder I was going to drive his car. Well, then, you know, then this things I don't, not used to hearing. He says, well, did you sign a contract? I go, no, but I kind of told the guy he was going to do it. And then Ernie was kind of mad at me for, for not jumping ship. And I says, I can't. You know, Chevrolet said that. I told the man I would do it. I got to do it. Yeah. But and you hadn't signed the contract. I had not had it. It was, wow. it was, uh, that says Every bit of a month or two before yeah. we even got a contract. Wow. But I told the guy I would do it. No different than I did with Bill Baumgartner. Yeah. Told him I'd do it. He asked me to do it, told him I'd do it. And and then later, uh, when I ran for Bill Davis, it was the same way. He wanted me to run it. And I told him I'd do it. And I I had a guy try to steal me out of there during the time that we were running for a championship. And I said, I can't. I said, I told the guy I would do it. In trucks? In, in the trucks. Okay. And even the guy says, well, you, I heard you don't have a contract. I go, yeah, I know. But... I said I was going to write, and we finished the year out, and that one was Bill was shutting down, and I actually called over to that 
that team to do that. And he says, no, you turned me down. So I said, I just, that was the first time I was probably not real happy with the, with the person. And I says, well, one of those things you probably regret saying, but I says, well, then I'll probably never run for you. If you can't take my base word saying what I'm going to do, base a contract or not, is I'll never run for you anyways. Wow. So, but I'm getting old at that point yeah. in time, so I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 